Hi, welcome back to Latin American Perspectives, the Latin American Studies course. My name is Tom O'Brien. I want to welcome you to this session. I'm going to be talking about the history of 19th century politics in Latin America. Now, first of all, on the surface of it, Latin American politics in the 19th century don't appear to be very interesting for two reasons. One is because they're difficult to grasp, because regimes are changing so fast you can't possibly keep track of all the actors. If you want to stump the stars question for a Latin American history professor, ask them to name the presidents of Mexico in succession from, let's say, 1823 to 1858. Uh, don't ask me because I can't do it. So keeping all of this minutiae in place is a challenge in and of itself. And the second fact that appears to make this less than a fascinating topic is simply that much of what happens, again, appears to be simply conflicts between competing elite groups over who will control these states. Uh, both of those facts are true, but they don't reflect the reality of what was going on. What was actually going on in Latin America in the 19th century concerned issues that remain of grave significance even today in the region. And that includes, one, how to achieve development, how to achieve modernity in the broader sense. In other words, not just economic development, but the development of societies uh, that have rational policy-making programs that provide basic services to their citizens in which people can participate with a reasonable degree of security in the political system and where they feel they have the guarantee of certain basic rights. All those aspects of modernity are still a matter of debate today in Latin America. And coupled with that is the question of whether these societies in trying to achieve development can also create reasonably equitable social and economic systems where everyone has at least some reasonable degree of access to the economic resources of society. These issues were in contest in the 19th century they may remain a matter of contest today in the 21st century. So we're looking at some fundamental concerns within Latin American societies when we talk about 19th century politics, no matter what appears to be going on the surface. And that's what we're going to try to look at, both the superficial, the surface events, but also what do they mean, what's the underlying struggle. If we go to the first slide here, I know you've already discussed Latin American independence, so I'm not going to touch on it at any great length, except to say that independence, and the, especially the independence struggles, severely damaged Latin American societies. The long wars that occurred did vast damage to mines and haciendas, the basic economic sinews of these countries. And in addition, the old Spanish colonial system had bound these regions together in a hierarchical system where the monarchy played off various interest groups, including leaders of the church and leaders of the bureaucracy and landowners, against one another and against the larger population in order to maintain power. When independence came, as one historian said, it was sort of like pulling the hub out of a spoked wheel that hub was the monarchy, all the spokes were the constituent parts of these societies, and suddenly there was a considerable degree of fractiousness within Latin American societies, north to south. So we have serious problems coming from independence, and they will be reflected in some of the turmoil in the early decades after independence is achieved. Some indications of that are, one, uh, the collapse of Simon Bolivar's dream of a Bolivarian republic in northern South America. That dream didn't even survive past his death before the constituent parts broke up into independent nations that eventually became modern countries such as Venezuela and Colombia. A similar situation occurred in Central America. After originally emerging to independence as a part of Mexico, the Central American republics tried to form their own confederation, which they did, but it lasted less than two decades, and for most of its brief history was racked by conflict among its constituent parts before the various provinces split off and set up 
these separate Central American republics. So very early on, there's clear indications at the regional level of this political instability, of this fractiousness that characterizes this era. Now, when it comes to political philosophies in the first part of the 19th century, the key political philosophy was liberalism. Ideas taken from the Enlightenment in Europe that stressed such things as rational planning and decision making, the creation of representative government, the ideal of free market economies, all of these issues and individual rights uh, were transferred to Latin America and certain elements of the elite set them as their goals politically, that they wanted to create states that would reflect these various principles of the Enlightenment. And along with those other ideas, particularly important in Latin America, was a concept of secularism, which for our purposes would simply mean the separation of the Catholic Church from its privileged position, essentially as the state religion in almost all of the new Latin American republics, and the creation of a secular society in which religion would not have a direct role in policy making, in the legal system, and most importantly for the liberals, in the educational system. As the liberals went about trying to achieve these goals, it has to be pointed out, because it's an important part of what we're talking about today, that right from the beginning, uh, the liberal ideals were often not fulfilled in the actual management of government and societies. For example, in Peru after independence, Indian tribute, the payment of taxes by the indigenous population, was abolished because that, of course, was an entirely illiberal type of policy. In other words, taxing people simply because of their ethnicity. But very soon after abolition, the Republican government of Peru began imposing just that kind of tax once again. So we often find a reversion to these very unequal types of economic and social policies. And this becomes a constant problem within Latin America as the liberals struggle to create this vision that they have of modern society. Now, challenging the liberals were the conservatives. Basically, the conservatives disagreed on two fundamental points. One, they did not want to see the limitations on the power of the church proposed by the liberals because they felt the church had functioned effectively as a social control mechanism, helping to keep the large indigenous and mixed race populations in line by convincing them that, in fact, it was God's will that they maintain their subordinated position in society. So the conservatives are concerned about the church primarily for practical reasons, because it helps maintain social order. And they were also concerned that the economic policies of the liberals, uh, which begin to aim at taking land, not only from the church, but from peasant communities, for the purpose of putting it on the market, selling the land, and seeing commercial growers produce export crops on that land, the conservatives are concerned that that kind of assault on the lands of the indigenous population, the peasant population in general, is going to set off violent conflicts, as it did at times in Latin America during the 19th and well into the 20th centuries. So the conservatives are not necessarily opposed to exploiting the local population. They were deeply involved in that themselves. Both of these groups consist of people who are maybe landowners, merchants, both liberals and conservatives. It's just that the conservatives prefer to maintain the existing forms of exploitation rather than shifting to the type of system that the liberals have proposed of abolishing church and village controlled land and setting up a free market inland that will hopefully commercialize agriculture and increase agricultural exports. This assault upon peasant villages was going to trigger often violent reactions. Peasants were well aware that they were being exploited either way, whether it was by being forced to go and work on the land of the great Hacendado, a landowner, or by being thrown off their land for the purposes of selling it to private commercial interests. It's just that the traditional existing 
forms of exploitation were the devil that they knew as opposed to this new form of exploitation that the liberals had proposed. And furthermore, what the liberals were proposing was a direct attack on the basic material support mechanism of peasant communities, of rural communities throughout Latin America, whether they were, again, were indigenous communities, mixed race communities. Their basic subsistence, their support as peasant villages depended upon control of this land. So the liberals clearly represented the most dangerous threat to the ongoing growth and development of rural communities throughout Latin America. And needless to say, there would be resistance. Popular resistance would take various forms. Sometimes people simply fled from the regions that were the target of land, we might as well call it expropriations because that's what it really was, uh, to seek land perhaps that was less fertile, less arable, uh, perhaps in the highlands, perhaps in rainforest regions. But very often, peasants would turn towards armed uprisings to challenge the liberal agenda. Now, these uprisings and this resistance didn't occur in simple, explainable patterns. It's one of the reasons why we often have such a hard time understanding all of the turmoil of 19th century politics because it was never simply a matter of, well, the, the elite, the liberal elite especially, is over on one side, and here are the peasant communities on the other. Oftentimes, communities align with members of the elite. They align with local power brokers, maybe local landowners even. Why? Because they're looking for assistance in carrying out their project of defending their lands, defending their way of life. And sometimes the most viable method to do that is to align yourself with groups that already have some degree of power in society. We see this sometimes in a phenomenon known as caudillismo, uh, which simply means personalism. Caudillos were personalist leaders, and what that meant was that their power rested primarily not on a set of ideological concepts, on affinity for or support for a specific political movement, but rather on personal loyalties that that leader had created between himself and larger communities. Oftentimes, this took the form of what we call patron-client relations, the caudillo providing certain services to peasant communities, let us say, and they, in return, providing their support to him. If he serves as a protector, they will provide resources to him and support to him. So caudillos were people who had gathered personal loyalty and support in order to exercise power in the turbulent conditions, in especially in the first half of the 19th century in Latin America, although, as we will see, this phenomenon persists at least to the end of the 19th and at times into the 20th century. Now, how did this kind of phenomena function in a practical way? One example comes from Argentina. And I've noted here on the slide, Argentina, a city, not a nation. That's because in many parts of Latin America, after independence, the control of the national government often did not extend beyond the capital. Much the same thing was said, for example, not only of Buenos Aires in Argentina, but of Lima, Peru, that the national government really couldn't exercise much control outside of the capital city. In the case of Buenos Aires, that took on increased significance because not only was it the capital, but it was surrounded by what became the federal district of Buenos Aires, and that encompassed vast grassy plains or pampas that were used for grazing cattle and that therefore provided the chief economic resource available to Argentina at this time. So in one small area, the capital and the immediate surrounding province, lie not only the national government, but also the principal resource of the country at this time. Now, governing Argentina, or at least Buenos Aires and the surrounding regions, at this period was a man named Juan Manuel de Rosas, and Juan Manuel de Rosas was a classic caudillo. 
a man who had built up personal loyalties in order to gain power in the region and specifically to claim control over all of Argentina, whether he could do that in practical terms or not. And he built that support based on the nomadic cowboys or gauchos of the Pampas. These nomadic riders who would gather up cattle, this was not, cattle raising at this time is not the kind of thing that you see later in the American West uh, with barbed wire fences and controlled animals and uh, the raising of specific types of cattle. There was simply wild cattle wandering the Pampas and landowners would use the services of the gauchos to hunt down the animals uh, that were mostly slaughtered and used for their hides. The gauchos represented a violent, nomadic community, and Rosas, who himself was an accomplished horseman and physically fearless, was able to create a base of support among this group and create for himself along the way a very powerful and mobile military force out of the gauchos. This support from the gauchos that is, again, largely focused on Rosas himself, not any set of particular ideas, was a classic instance of a situation where a caudillo builds up support in this fashion and is able to exercise national political control. Now, one of the things the gauchos were concerned about had to do with liberal plans for modernizing cattle grazing in the region. The importance to them was whether their lifestyle was going to be reduced to a simple matter of wage labor. Were they going to become essentially wage laborers? Would they lose the freedom that they now enjoyed essentially as these nomadic herdsmen across the Pampas? So they were opposed to the liberal project at least for that reason, if not for many others. And on that basis alone, they would rally to the support of Rosas, who himself was opposed to many aspects of liberalism and felt it did not fit, was not appropriate for Argentinian society in the first half of the 19th century. Now, another instance arises in Guatemala hmm? with the leader Rafael Carrera. Hmm? Guatemala was also under liberal rule for a period, before Carrera led a rebellion in 1839 and gained power and continued to rule until his death in 1865. Carrera was able to fashion an alliance between indigenous peasants, the Catholic Church, and conservative landowners. He himself was of mixed race, but he was able to fashion this alliance by essentially offering to stall the liberal project in Guatemala. Now, large landowners fully intended to go on exploiting peasant labor much as they had in the past, but those were traditional forms of exploitation. For example, uh, a landowner might have claims on the labor of villages who live near his estate, and he could call on their labor whenever he chose in order to secure work from these people. But that had been going on for centuries. That was a well understood and established form of exploitation. What the liberals were proposing, first of all, was again removing land from the hands of the indigenous peasants, turning it over to the free market and letting commercial developers produce export crops on that land. And secondly, they were insistent upon using labor drafts by the state to develop public works projects. Roads had to be built, ports had to be developed, there were a whole array of projects that had to be undertaken if Guatemala was to modernize. And the liberals fully intended to use the powers of the state to exploit indigenous labor. And you didn't get paid for this kind of work, you simply got subsistence, enough food to keep you alive, and you might well be trotted off for a project to build a road, dig a well, or whatever else it was that the national government wanted. So there were clearly forms of exploitation that were new in the liberal project and that led to this reaction by the indigenous population. What Carrera offered with his allies, the landowners and the churchmen, was to essentially 
freeze the economic process in place to continue with the existing methods of exploitation, if you will, which to the indigenous population were far less reprehensible than the new ideas brought by the liberals. Once again, we have a caudillo who is essentially a populist who is building a base of support focused on him as an individual. But there are practical underlying gains to be made by the local population in supporting this particular personalist leader in Guatemala. So we see in the first half of the 19th century especially that as the liberals try to pursue these ideas about modernization, that they run up against popular resistance and that at times popular resistance takes the form of a coalescence of forces around individual personalist leaders like Carrera, like Rosas, who essentially try to stall the liberal project and to maintain what were, yes, unequal relationships in society and in the political order, but were not as reprehensible, at least in the eyes of the local population, as were the plans of the liberals. Another such project takes place in Mexico. There, Mexico in the 1850s experiences what was known as the Reforma. It's the coming to power, especially of Benito Juarez, a man who Hollywood later liked to sort of depict as the Mexican Abraham Lincoln. I'm not quite sure that the local populations would agree with that particular characterization. Uh, Juarez was the leader of the Mexican liberals, and his regime attempted to pursue many of the same policies that I've just been talking about. Specifically, the liberal regime passed what was known as the Ley Lerdo, a law which provided for taking of land from village communities and from the church and putting that land on sale. Needless to say, just as with the other liberal projects in places like Argentina and Guatemala, this kind of effort, which was now in the form of national legislation, prompted considerable resistance. And again, it was not always clearly defined in terms of, well, it's the peasants against the liberals and other members of the elite, because oftentimes the peasants would align themselves with local caudillos, who themselves might be large landowners. But the main issue was to resist the law and the loss of land. Now, the Mexican liberals were going to face a lot of other problems, such as the invasion of the French uh, when they failed to pay their international debt. But one factor that kept states weak in Latin America in the first half of the 19th century was popular resistance to these projects. Conservative opposition alone, while it could certainly inhibit many of these plans, could not have had the same kind of powerful effect as did the actions of various groups, whether they're migratory gauchos or indigenous peasants in Guatemala. This kind of popular resistance had a powerful effect on deterring the efforts of the liberals to radically transform their societies and to do so largely at the expense of the lower half of the population. Now, despite these setbacks, which helped create so much of this turmoil that we're familiar with in the 19th century, and particularly in the first half of the century. Despite that, over time, by the 1870s, liberal regimes started to take hold in most Latin American countries. When I say started to take hold, I mean started to establish some permanence. Unlike the upheavals of the past, where there are frequent regime changes, where the liberals are in one day and the conservatives the next, as we get to the 1870s, we see the emergence of liberal regimes that have staying power and therefore can pursue their goals. Uh, one such regime after the passing of Carrera was that of Justo Rufino Barrios in Guatemala. And Barrios followed a classic pattern. What he wanted to do was develop an export product, initially coffee, develop transportation networks, the principal port of Guatemala today is still Puerto Barrios, improve roads, 
build railroads, all of it designed to speed the development of the national economy and along the way empower the state to further advance this agenda. And one of the important ways of doing that for the liberals of this era as we get to the third quarter of the 19th century is creating stronger state systems, especially the military. And the purpose of the military, more often than not, was first to maintain internal order. If indeed the church's power is being limited, and it is in many Latin American countries by this time, uh, the conservatives weren't entirely wrong. The church was an important mechanism of social control. So what is to replace at least some of this diminished church power? More powerful military forces. Barrios was a classic case of this. He used the military to enforce labor drafts in Guatemala to help build his roads and his port. Uh, when people were drafted into these projects, it was quite likely that you'd never get return home because you'd be killed as a result of simply the brutal working conditions, lack of sufficient food. Uh, you might be murdered on your way back because you might be taken hundreds of miles from your home. So people were not exactly dying for the opportunity. Well, they were dying, but not for the opportunity to serve in the labor drafts. So as a result, force had to be used uh, to keep these people working on these projects and to track them down when they did succeed in running away. So Bidus's projects and his policies are very much in keeping with the liberal agenda of an earlier age. It's just that he's developing more of the mechanisms needed to actually carry them out. Another figure who also represents a replacement of a populist caudillo from an earlier time uh, is Domingo Sarmiento, who ruled Argentina from 1868 to 1874. Sarmiento, again, was a classic liberal, but it is interesting how he depicted the struggle that was going on in Argentina because I think it typified how liberals in general viewed their struggles at this time. We might think of liberalism, and certainly its enlightenment creators hmm. believe that liberal political ideas and institutions and economic institutions were meant to free people, meant to push away the accumulation of superstition and exploitation that had long burdened European societies. And you would expect much the same thing in Latin America, that liberalism would be, as its title suggests, a liberating philosophy. But what Sarmiento said was that, and in fact, even, as this is the subtitle of a book, that what was going on in Argentina was the struggle between civilization and barbarism. Civilization meaning the liberals who were trying to bring modern society, modern ideas, modern institutions, versus the barbarians. And who are they? Uh, the gauchos and generally the lower classes of Argentine society, they are the barbaric, uncivilized groups. So the liberals don't see themselves necessarily on a mission of liberal, liberal or liberating people, as we would think, but rather they see themselves in this titanic struggle against these barbaric populations, the indigenous and uh, mixed-race populations that constitute 90-95% of the populations of Latin American countries in general, that in some ways these people are the enemy hmm. because they're opposed to so many of these changes, and we've already seen some of the reasons why that would be true. Again, as with Barrios in Guatemala, so too Sarmiento and liberals coming to power elsewhere in Latin America look towards the development of a key export product, hmm that would help fuel their economic growth. In Guatemala, it had been coffee. In Argentina, it was beef. Going beyond the conventional, traditional methods of cattle raising, which meant essentially hunting down the cattle that ran wild across the Pampas, now modern forms of cattle grazing are being brought to Argentina fencing off the pampas, developing specific breeds of cattle, developing salting 
plants where you can actually salt the meat instead of just taking the hide. Now you can export not only the hides but the salted beef as well. All that modernization, of course, had to be linked up with powerful external interests. In most Latin American countries at this time, that meant the British. Because the British had the ships, they had the financing to make all of this work. They could finance these export products that were developed by groups in Guatemala, Argentina, Peru, Chile, etc. They would provide the financing and the transportation. However, it also required certain activities within these countries, besides fences, besides commercialization of agriculture, planting of coffee plants. It also meant a new disciplining of the labor force. That's why, in addition to state labor drafts that Barrios had instituted in Guatemala or that he helped enforce, there was also increasing use of what had been a practice from the past, but now became more intensive in its use, and that was debt peonage. Debt peonage simply means the re acquisition of debt, the accumulation of debt, usually by peasants. Peasants who face the responsibilities of a marriage ceremony for one of their children, peasants who have run short of grain and need a loan of grain so that they'll have a seed crop for the next year. So they borrow. They borrow from large landowners. They borrow from merchants. And what collateral can they give? Their labor. So that the landowner or the merchant can then come back and demand labor from them in return for payment of that debt. That's how they would pay the debt off, by working for the landowner, by working for the merchant. And the merchant might contract them up. For example, in Peru, you'd be sent into the mines to work in the mines by the merchant to whom you owe the debt until you had worked long enough to pay that debt off. Usually, you never managed to pay the debt off. So this became, in essence, a form of forced labor. But this kind of forced labor was now required on an intensive basis because of the effort to create these export products, debt peons to work the coffee plantations in Guatemala. Then what about those gauchos? Well, they're not very useful as simply nomadic herdsmen. They need to be working on the ranches. Employees, the kinds of cowboys that we're familiar with from the American West who work on large cattle ranches. Well, that's what the gauchos are going to have to become. But how were you going to force them to do that? Well, it was fairly simple. Uh, the liberals developed a variety of laws. For example, laws against knife fights, which were very common among gauchos, and other forms of public disturbance. The key elements in the law being punishment for those actions was in the form of payment in labor. The fine had to be paid with work. It's a little bit like the chain gang operations that once existed in the United States in the American South, where you got thrown in jail, and next thing you knew, you were out working for some planter, harvesting his cotton. Um, same kind of thing in Argentina. They were going to reduce the gauchos, essentially, to a stable wage labor force, and they used the power of the law to do that. You found that you wound up in jail, and the only way you were going to get out was by going and working for one of the cattle estancias or the cattle estates. So the liberals have come up with intensified mechanisms of labor exploitation in order to help them make their export economies work. Now, as I said, this process helped empower these liberal states certainly by the 1870s. You have states with increasing revenues, thanks to these export products that they have developed. You have states with increasing military power, thanks to those revenues. And along the way, what is going to happen as well is that these states are going to start contending with each other internationally, sometimes over border disputes, but sometimes over more fundamental issues as well. 
what we see in the late 1860s and into the 1870s are a series of international conflicts, armed conflicts, within Latin America that are expressions of both the increasing power and stability of state systems, but also of some fundamental conflicts between these states. And as I said, sometimes it's about border disputes, but a lot of times there are more fundamental issues. One place where that occurred was down along the River Plate estuary, River Plate that runs along the borders of what is modern-day Uruguay and Argentina and Paraguay. What led to the War of the Triple Alliance in this region, which pitted Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil against Paraguay, is a matter of considerable dispute. What we do know is the war took place between 1864 and 1870. Just as our own civil war was in its final throes, a violent international conflict was erupting in the southern cone of South America. The enormity of this conflict, it can be gauged by what happened to Paraguay, this one small country that took on two behemoths in the form of Brazil and Argentina, and then a third power, Uruguay. Hmm. Estimates of population vary wildly, hmm. as they usually do when you're talking about 19th century Latin America. But probably a reasonable estimate is that at the start of the war, Paraguay's population may have numbered 500,000. By the end of the war, in 1870, it probably numbered no more than 200,000. 60% of the population had died in this war. And as usual with wars, most of it was not directly from battlefield casualties, but rather the civilian population dying off, uh, the destruction of crops, famine, the spread of disease, had catastrophic impacts on Paraguay it would take more than half a century for Paraguay's population to recover. The target of all of this was the dictatorial ruler of Paraguay. That's not saying much because <laughs> most presidents were dictators in Latin America at this time. Uh, Francisco Solano Lopez. Lopez has been accused of being a bit strange, uh, which he probably was. And it is said that his overarching ambitions to interfere in the politics of Uruguay and to try to dominate the region, even though his country, in terms of population and material resources, is much smaller than virtually any of the other nations in the region, that this overreaching ambition is what triggered the war. Uh, there's certainly some truth to that. But it is also a fact that Solano Lopez and his father before him, who had been the previous ruler, was largely opposed to the spreading influence of the British. Uruguay, Brazil, Argentina were all pursuing these liberal economic policies based on exports of agricultural products and, of course, dependent upon close ties to the British. Solano Lopez and his father had tried to pursue a policy more of self-sufficiency or autarky, where they would survive without resources from the outside. That they would be self-sufficient, that they would build their own industrial base, even if it simply consisted of crude artisan industries. They were a little bit like North Korea today, isolated power center that wanted to survive outside of the international market. And that, as much as the ambitions of Solano Lopez, probably contributed to the outbreak of this war and its devastating consequences, that the threat of cutting off the influence of the British, who were so critical to all three of these other powers, hmm, to interfere with their ability to navigate on the River Plate, and to maintain this open international set of economies, that alone was enough to bring on this massive attack upon Paraguay, 
in the 1860s. Hmm. Yeah. Um, in, in talking about the relationship that uh, a lot of these South American countries had with the British, since colonization was not so far in the past, were the caudillos and the peasants in the church opposed to not only the modernization, but also with this relationship that in order to modernize needed these outside European economic help? Was that, a, was that an issue with the conservatives? It is an issue, although it tends, when you're talking about uh, popular groups and the church, a lot of it had to do with cultural issues. And this was a highly sensitive subject because the British, of course, are Protestants and there was deep hostility from church leaders towards the presence of the British. In most Latin American countries through much of the 19th century, uh, you couldn't even be buried uh, on sacred ground because it was all controlled by the Catholic Church. So if you were a British resident and you passed away, you basically had to be buried in the potter's field. And only over time did this change. And local populations uh, also saw the Protestantism of the British as something that was hostile to their interests as well because very often the church had served as their protector. The church also provided the legitimacy behind many of the religious rites and cultural practices and festivities that were a core part of the activities of rural and urban populations as well. So a lot of this was not based on some kind of, you know, complex understanding of what it meant to engage in free trade with the British, but rather with some basic cultural conflicts. The conservative landowners, on the other hand, really weren't opposed to free trade. It was really a matter of how quickly was this process going to proceed and how much and how radical would be the change in, in terms of internal social and economic policies and trying to avoid disruption of the so internal social system. But otherwise, of course, they benefited as much as the liberals from British ships, uh, British railroads that were, going to, were being built at this time because they too were exporting crops. But it was a matter of at what rate of speed is this kind of change going to go on. And I think by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, uh, there's very little disagreement between conservatives and liberals of any kind over the basic ideas of free trade because it's now apparent that it can be carried out uh, without facing outright rebellion and revolution. At least that's what they thought at the end of the 19th century. Another of these state wars that occur erupts on the west coast of South America, and it pits Chile against two of its northern neighbors, Peru and Bolivia. Now, the war technically is said to drag on to 1884, but really it was over by 1881. Chile, who was really the instigator in all of this, had enjoyed a unique history in Latin America after independence, where other countries suffered all kinds of fractious events, overthrows of governments, uprisings. Chile was relatively peaceful. A lot of factors came into play here. Part of it was that the country was relatively compressed initially in terms of its geographical extent. It had a very coherent elite, what were called the Cuatrocientos, or the 400 families, that were a well-integrated governing group. And the country also enjoyed considerable prosperity. It became a major exporter of wheat and copper, much of the wheat that was used to make bread for the 49ers in California came from Chile. Hmm. So they had very extensive and prosperous export markets that they dealt with in the 19th century. But by the end of the 1870s, that prosperity was disappearing. Hmm. Chile was losing its markets for agricultural products and for copper. One of the reasons for that was a factor that would come to affect many Latin American countries in the next few decades, and that is that these labor control methods that had been instituted, 
some in the 19th century, some going back to the colonial era, were not terribly efficient. In Chile, there were two types, uh, specifically. One was uh, a system of inquilinos, which is really taken from the Spanish verb to rent. Inquilinos were essentially tenant farmers. They were given a piece of land and a large estate and allowed to work it in return for providing their labor to the large landowner. Inquilinos had few rights. There was a large surplus rural population in Chile, which meant that inquilinos were relatively well off because they actually had a semi-permanent position on the large estates. When additional labor was needed, the landowner could usually secure it simply by offering a feast to some of the migratory laborers who populated the by roads of Chile on a daily basis. So this is a very repressive system. There is not a competitive labor market in the countryside. Landowners have tight control. And as a result, labor is so cheap that they don't have to innovate. Right down to the 1930s, the principal non-human mechanism for agricultural production in Chile was the ox. Mechanization was not high on the list of priorities. So too, in mining, a form of debt peonage and ganche was used. Credit would be extended to a worker to go work in the mines, and then he had to go on working until he had paid off that credit which might take forever. Again, labor was readily controlled. There was not a competitive wage labor market where people could simply pack up and go and accept a higher wage offer from somewhere else. They had a legal obligation to stay where they were. And again, there was little in the way of innovation in Chilean mining. Where other countries, the United States, even Argentina, Spain, are beginning to innovate in agricultural production and in mining, Chile had failed to do so, and now it was losing markets as a result of that failure to become more productive, to improve productivity. With the decline of both of these major export markets, the Chileans set their sights on the desert regions to their north. Most of those desert regions were controlled by Bolivia and Peru. It was to secure those areas that the Chileans went to war because in those desert areas were nitrates. Nitrates are primarily used today, as they were back in the middle of the 19th century, to make fertilizer. They were a powerful technology that had allowed European agriculturalists to go on increasing their production, even as they work the same fields year after year. And their application was growing, spreading across Europe, into North America, and beyond. The only commercially viable sources of nitrate in the world at this time were in the deserts on the southern fringes of Peru, the southwestern regions of Bolivia, and the far northern reaches of Chile. To seize these areas was to seize an incredibly valuable resource that could resuscitate Chile's economy. So we see in the coming of this war that it is prompted in no small part by the fact that the liberalism of the 19th century up to this time has not solved this basic problem. Yes, you can commercialize agriculture and you can find export crops of various kinds, but can you produce them efficiently? If you're still using debt peonage and ganche, other forms of forced labor, this does not create efficiency. There's no motivation on the part of landowners, mine owners, to improve technology because wages are low. Furthermore, people who are in these systems as workers hardly have any incentive at all to work harder, to become more efficient on their own. It's not like there's, you know, a career ladder out there uh, for an inquilino that, oh, you can climb to the top of the ladder and become a major landowner of your own accord. No, that's not going to happen. So people have no incentives 
So this problem had not been solved. In the case of the Chileans, the answer is, well, invade your neighbors and take over this valuable resource. One thing that happened as a result of the Chilean invasion of Peru is that we again see triggered this popular resistance from below as Peruvian peasants in the highlands take up arms against the Chilean invaders and begin giving expression to their own sense of nationhood. People like Domingo Sarmiento perhaps thought that the people of the countryside in Latin America were nothing but barbarians. The Peruvian peasants proved they had a very real sense of their own self-interest and of their position as citizens of a nation, despite the fact that that nation might offer them few, if any, real rights or benefits. So we see in these events some of the early expressions of popular nationalism that are emerging in Latin America, very different from the kind of nationalistic ideas and modernization concepts that were so popular among the liberals. Now, the Chileans were able to solve their problem very simply. Occupy the nitrate regions of the desert. And then all you had to do was let the system function because long before the Chileans seized these desert regions, British investors had come in, brought in industrial technologies from Europe and set up the refineries or oficinas that processed the nitrate. So the Chileans really don't have to innovate. You don't have to go out and educate your population. You don't have to go out and develop new universities, something more than one university that will educate a handful of the children of the elite. You don't have to radically alter your labor systems because the British have brought in technology that at least for the immediate future solves those problems for you. The crisis of productivity, at least in Chile, is solved by essentially consuming <laughs> British technology by occupying the northern deserts. In turn, Chile's economy revived because the government now had enormous resources which it could loan out to landowners, actually at negative interest rates. So the landowners were actually earning income simply by borrowing money from the government. The government helped fuel private banking in Chile because it deposited these huge resources in private banks and didn't even demand payment of interest. And of course, merchants benefited from the shipment of products from central Chile into the desert regions. So the entire national economy is revived. The productivity crisis is solved as a result of this war, the war of the Pacific. But of course, that's not going to be true for all of Latin America. Not every Latin American state can go out and seize a territory that happens to have in it already European technologies that will solve some of these economic problems. By the end of the War of the Pacific in the early 1880s, we're beginning to see yet another wave of liberalism. We saw the early efforts to create liberal regimes and economic systems in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, usually failed efforts. Then we see some successes coming by the 1860s and 70s. And then by the 1880s, but especially the 1890s, yet another age of liberalism is upon us. As these regimes become further consolidated, and now develop an ideology which is very much in line with the conditions in Latin America, at least as the liberal elites perceive them. They now adhere to a philosophy or an ideology known as positivism. Positivism, as with liberalism, had its roots in Europe. The French intellectual Auguste Comte had devised the basic principles of positivism, what he saw as the first scientific ideology. 
what Comte was suggesting was that social, political issues could now be subjected to the same kind of scientific analysis that was going on in fields like physics and biology and chemistry. That we could use the basic scientific methods to analyze the problems of society, the structures of political systems, and to create new modern societies to achieve human progress through scientific analysis and then implement policies based on those scientific principles. Critical to what Comte is talking about is the idea that order is essential to progress. Human progress cannot be achieved without order. And in turn, as human societies progress, their goal must be to sustain and reinforce that order. For the elites of Latin America, and basically it's liberal elites who dominate virtually all of the region in the closing decades of the 19th century, this set of ideas fit perfectly with what they saw both as the real conditions in their societies and the goals that they wish to achieve. Because, essentially, it provided a justification for authoritarian rule. There's a basic contradiction that runs through Latin American liberalism in the 19th century that usually these regimes, not always, but more often than not, so-called liberal regimes are actually uh, regimes run by liberal dictators. These are not democratic systems. These are not systems created by popular consensus. In most Latin American countries, a tiny, tiny fraction of the population actually got to vote. If there were 400,000 people in a country, maybe three or 4,000 had the vote. And even with that restricted franchise, and even as we get into the later decades of the 19th century, people like Barrios, for example, would be considered by any fair observer as a dictator. So there's a basic contradiction here between liberal political ideas, which at the very least call for some reasonable degree of representation, and, uh, a constitutional legitimate handover of power periodically, well, that wasn't really the reality that existed in most liberal regimes in Latin America. But here, with positivism, came an explanation for why we can't have that. Because you see, what we need is order. So the state must assume extraordinary powers to maintain order so that we can proceed with modernization, so that we can indeed bring human progress. And more specifically, we explain this by pointing out that our populations are simply not ready to function in a modern liberal political system. Why? Well, they're basically inferior. Well, this is not a part of positivist philosophy. It was certainly a widespread belief in Europe, in the United States, in Latin America, in the late 19th century, that non-white people were racially inferior and that they were not capable of being effective agents in a modern society. We have the civilization versus barbarism argument of Domingo Sarmiento now revised and cloaked in the ideas of positivism and the ideas of scientific racism. Because, of course, racists of the late 19th century believed that they could prove the inherent inferiority of non-white groups. They like to do things like measure the size of your head and uh, demonstrate, well, you know, your head is smaller than other people, so you can't be as bright as other people are. 
would have been shocked to find out that a lot of very bright people have very small brains, uh, or very small heads, uh, with large brains inside. Um, but this provided a justification then for the continuation of authoritarian rule in Latin America. And the idea that there's a purpose to this. This isn't just for purposes of exploitation. We are trying to modernize. We're trying to bring human progress. But we can only do that if we exercise this kind of control. Yeah. Um, what you were just talking about, that's, that's kind of interesting. Because how were countries like um, Brazil and Argentina able to sort of implement this type of positivism when there's such a large mixture of races? So basically, I guess what I guess it would come up to these elite families that were sort of from colonization from European countries, and you know, I guess fashion themselves to be superior. But I I think that's kind of interesting since Latin American is so mixed with so many races. Yeah, but it's true that what had happened, for example, many of the elites in the period immediately after independence didn't even want to have republican forms of government. In fact, Brazil, through an interesting set of turn of events, uh, wound up with a monarchy through most of the 19th century, essentially imported the Portuguese monarchy into Brazil. Uh, so these elites, yes, for most of the 19th century, had been ruling through mechanisms that excluded virtually the entire population of their own countries from participation in the political process. Now they're coming up with a justification for why that's necessary and must be done. They're trying to eliminate the contradiction between liberal political principles and the realities of political rule in Latin America at this time. And they go a step further than that. Uh, in many countries, especially Argentina, but Chile attempted this, Brazil to a lesser degree, and that was the idea that their populations were so inferior, that the only way, Mexico tried it too, the only way to improve these groups would be to whiten them, which meant efforts to encourage mass emigration from Europe, and especially they preferred Northern Europe, <laughs> whiter people, uh, give you a better race, um, to encourage mass emigration from Europe so that these people would bring what they thought were, you know, what the elites would believe were their sort of special qualities as white people in terms of being energetic, dynamic, intelligent. And over time, hopefully those qualities would be disseminated through the population. So in many cases, they're saying, look, even with decades of government policy, of building schools supposedly and providing economic growth, that that won't be enough to overcome these racial uh, handicaps that exist in our populations. So we have to bring in masses of Europeans. Uh, the Argentinians probably did that to the greatest extent. There was a vast uh, emigration. Uh, what the Argentinian elite didn't like is that most of it came from Italy and Spain, which were not in part of that northern European culture. So, yeah, you have this incredible contradiction uh, between the liberal principles of the elite and what actually goes on in Latin America in the 19th century, and that's why in many ways, they found such comfort and positivism, which essentially provide them with a justification of why this had to be done. A good example of this is, as I was mentioning with Brazil, uh, the national motto of Brazil is order and progress. And you notice order comes first. That you know, This is a positivist motto. We have to have order. We have to have firm government rule, keep order within society in order to move forward. And, of course, it does contradict realities. But when those contradictions came to the surface and were challenged in any way, uh, the state moved rapidly to eliminate them. One of the most striking cases occurs in Brazil in the 1890s. A man named Antonio Vicente Martial, who was a, if you want to call it, itinerant preacher, healer, created a community in northeastern Brazil called Canudos, out in the backlands. It was a community of about 25,000 people. It drew upon essentially the wretched of Brazilian society, landless peasants, recently freed slaves. And the state sees this community as a threat to the established order. Here are the 
non-white majority forming their own urban center, their own government, their own culture. And as a result, the government sent in the military on three separate occasions to attack and finally overwhelm and destroy the settlement. Why? Because it contradicted the basic political philosophies of the ruling elite and threatened them by showing the ability of the rural population to organize and create their own coherent system of self-rule. That's what led to the massacre at Canudos in 1897. Perhaps the personification of positivist thinking and ideas in Latin America came in Mexico with the rule of Porfirio Diaz. Diaz, although there was one presidential term which he does not serve, essentially controlled Mexico from 1876 to 1911. In some ways, Diaz is a classic Caudillo figure. He's incredibly effective at winning over people's loyalties and at the same time of removing his enemies, isolating them, shifting people around, for example, military leaders, if he thinks they're becoming too influential in the local area. He has all the innate political skills of a classic Caudillo. But at the same time, he sees himself and his regime as responsible for the rapid modernization of Mexico. He gathers around him a group of advisors, known as the Cientificos, the scientists, who are advocates of positivist philosophy and ideas, and they begin pursuing the same concept of using state power to ensure internal stability and thereby accelerating economic growth and accelerating the general modernization of society. Of course, along the way, this would require a certain amount of force, such as the rural constabulary known as the rurales, who are responsible for suppressing uprisings in the countryside, which were frequent in Mexico throughout the 19th and into the early 20th century, as you'll be seeing more of later. At the same time that internal order was to be extended, the economy was to be opened up as never before hmm. to foreign interests, not simply as the British had usually done in most places, where they provided financing for trade and ships and mercantile networks, but rather by a vast increase in direct investment in Mexico itself. Because Mexico suffered from the same problem that Chile had, hmm. and that was problems in productivity. It used the same kinds of labor methods, basically, to produce agricultural products and mining products such as silver and copper. So it had the same kinds of problems. So it needed a vast infusion of outside capital and technology. And in this case, and as in most cases in Latin America, by the turn of the century, it was going to be the Americas who would come in and transform productive methods in Latin American countries. Diaz, more than any other ruler in Latin America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, flung open the doors to foreign interests, and as I said, especially the Americans. The British always had tended, with the exception of the nitrate industry, to stick to areas such as mercantile networks, banking, merchant marine, railroads. They really got involved directly in production. But the Americans were anxious to do that. They had produced new technologies in mining and agriculture that were highly efficient. And here was a golden opportunity. The Guggenheim brothers, who controlled the largest mining empire in the world at this time, were going to come in and revamp the copper mining industry and the silver mining industry of Chile, I mean of Mexico. The Morgan Bank, J.P. Morgan, was going to come in and loan vast sums of money to help spur this process of growth and development. 
the Americans would build a series of railroads north to south into Mexico to speed the export of Mexico's raw materials to the U.S. market and to ensure the import of vast amounts of American manufactured goods into Mexico. U.S. entrepreneurs would help lead the way in the development of Mexico's oil industry. And Diaz engaged in a massive giveaway of agricultural property in Mexico. A variety of mechanisms were set up in the 1880s, which made it extraordinarily easy, not only for wealthy Mexicans, but for wealthy Americans, to purchase vast areas of Mexico and to develop commercial agricultural production. Much of this occurring in the northern third of Mexico especially. Mexico is seen in the closing days of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century as a Latin American miracle. The growth of exports is at least 5% a year or more, both agricultural and mineral products. Its economy is expanding. Mexico City is being modernized. Railroads are tying the distant reaches of Mexico together. Port facilities are being developed. And yet, underneath the surface, as you'll learn, there are seething animosities towards this whole process. Even members of the elite who believe that their interests are being sacrificed to wealthy Americans, that wealthy Americans are given greater benefits in terms of business enterprise than wealthy Mexicans. Peasants who witness the loss of vast properties, who see their very way of life being destroyed on a scale probably unprecedented, at least up until this time, anywhere else in Latin America. Workers who find themselves subjected to intense disciplines by American corporations. All of these groups are becoming increasingly alienated by these policies of modernization that involve massive infusions of American capital and incredible increases in American power within Mexico itself. Rallying around a common theme of nationalism, they will challenge Diaz at the end of the first decade of the 20th century and bring on one of the most important upheavals to occur in modern Latin America, the Mexican Revolution. The story of the liberal project and popular resistance to that project are central to understanding Latin America in the 19th as well as the 20th centuries and on to the 21st. A perpetual dilemma between projects for development to achieve economic development to create modern societies coming into conflict with the issues of social and economic justice. 19th century liberalism offered a roadmap towards economic growth and modernization. But in its Latin American iteration, liberalism came to rely on many of the repressive mechanisms that had characterized Spanish colonial rule. But without the mediating force of the crown, for the state now committed to these same repressive mechanisms for accelerating economic growth. Inevitably, that has prompted resistance from popular forces, whether it's people like Rafael Carrera in the early 19th century, the mid-19th century, down to the residents of Canudos in the late 19th century, 
and on to the revolutionaries who had challenged Porfirio Diaz in the early 20th century. This has become a constant struggle within Latin America. In the 21st century, Latin American states have embraced neoliberalism, a renewal of many of the liberal ideas and projects of the late 19th century, open up the economies to foreign investment. And yet, problems of exploitation of the local population persist, as do signs of popular resistance, anti-globalization movements, the election of nationalist presidents like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. So the themes and the struggles of the 19th century are as relevant today as they were more than 100 years ago. Thank you.
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our second guest speaker for today's class. As our guest speaker for this part of class today, we are very fortunate to have with us Professor John Hart. He is an internationally and nationally renowned scholar of the history of Mexico, especially its modern history. Professor Hart has taught many undergraduate and graduate students here at the University of Houston, and he founded the graduate program in Latin American history. He is, an author, he is the author of numerous articles. He is also the author of a prize-winning book, Anarchism in the Mexican Working Class, 1860 to 1931, as well as the leading interpretive history of the Mexican Revolution, Revolutionary Mexico, the Coming and Process of the Mexican Revolution. The Mexican writer Carlos Fuentes has referred to this book as, and here I'm quoting, as a probing and passionate inquiry. One of the strengths of Mr. Hart's book is that he not only understands the presence of the past in Mexico, but that he organizes the mutual responses of traditionalism and modernization so clearly. Professor Hart is continuing his deeply probing inquiry into the revolutionary period in a new manuscript entitled Empire and Revolution. We are truly fortunate to have him here with us today to share his knowledge and insights into this cataclysmic and deeply formative period of Mexican history. Professor Hart. Thanks, Sue. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about one of the most complex phenomena of the modern age, uh, the Mexican Revolution. And uh, since we don't have a lot of time for such a complex phenomenon, uh, let me begin right away. Uh, underscoring its complexity, I think, uh, is our first consideration. And that is, beginning in the late 1890s until 1917, the world was swept by a series of uprisings and revolutions of which the Mexican Revolution was a part. The first of the really large uprisings occurred in China in 1898 and was followed up again in that country in 1911. Two others occurred in Iran and Russia in 1905. And in 1910, we had the great Mexican Revolution's beginning. Now, during that time, there was global unrest in South Africa, Cuba, the Philippines, Morocco, the Balkans. The end, the list seems endless. But those four great civilizations, ancient in their heritage, prehistoric in their heritage of Russia, Persia, China, and Mexico underscore something special, and that is the coupling of deep-seated traditions, inherited pasts, confronting dramatic transformations that really didn't work very well. And by transformations, I mean social, economic, and political transformations that we sometimes call modernization. In the case of Mexico, the country underwent a social and economic transformation between 1876 and 1910 that included the introduction of modern infrastructure, railroads, telegraph, hydroelectric power, paved streets, petroleum production, the industrial refining of rubber and metals, the introduction of steel smelters, and the reorganization of a country that was essentially 80% rural. In 1876, Mexico was a nation of 7.5 to 9 million people. In 1910, there were 15 million. During that time, the rural to urban demographic balance shifted somewhat. 
but not as dramatically as you might think during what I would call the beginning of the Mexican Industrial Revolution. Probably a shift of around 7 or 8 percent, from 87 or so percent rural to 80 percent. And the reason was that people were so resistant to moving to cities and adopting a new lifestyle, and so the factories had to go to them. And in looking at the Mexican landscape of the 1890s, you would be struck to find rural factories rather than urban ones. The capitalists took their new mode of production, factory production, to the countryside, to the people, since the people would not come to the cities. And the people accepted these employment opportunities with ambivalence. They wanted the advantages of additional income, additional well-being, but they did not want to give up their ways of life. Now this modernization process greatly strengthened the state in terms of its power and broadened its range of services. And that would mean trouble believe it or not. The services included a large expansion of the intellectual machine, that is the school system, creating poets and writers and critics and politically literate people by the tens of thousands so that the average industrial worker in Mexico, well I would say probably around 30 percent of them were literate. And a very large middle class had emerged in the cities that was politically aware and politically quite demanding. Now all that would have been fine if the economy had continued to grow. One of the expectations of the new intellectual awareness was a broader, more participatory democracy. The regime that had brought about the social and economic transformation was a dictatorship with appointed governors in the states and rubber stamp legislators. And beginning in the 1890s, the young intellectuals of the University Law School, the National University of Mexico Law School, began demonstrating in the streets of Mexico City calling for democratic elections. We want to elect our own representatives. We want to take part in the decision making. And at the same time, the abuses of the Industrial Revolution began to come under closer scrutiny from a coterie of new writers who protested excesses usually in dramatic, forlorn novels about heartbroken young couples, one of whom dies and the other carries, the male carries the deceased female off to her grave and, and the reader weeps at the end of the story. These are tragic stories of people broken by the new industrial machine. But by the mid-90s, the authors, without really realizing it, feel obliged to offer solutions and they begin talking about reform and more democracy and it wouldn't have this kind of ending if only we had a say in things. And again, the solutions are quite peaceful and reformist. But by the end of the 90s, with the police using truncheons on the protesting students in the streets, and with general strikes sweeping parts of central Mexico, the tenor of the protest literature changed. And famous writers like Heriberto Frias, who was the most popular writer of his time, began to tell their stories with more dramatic conclusions. Revolution. Overthrowing the tyrant. The dictator. And at the same time, another form of protest literature appeared. Uh, in a newspaper called El Hijo del Aguizote. Uh, 
Excuse me, you have a the pen of the desk? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got the wrong kind of pen. And in this newspaper, the dictator began to suffer perhaps the most dangerous kind of abuse for a politician. Mockery. Portrayed as a chongo or a monkey or a snake with a semi-human head. Uh, but always in the posture of abusing the common citizenry. And perhaps most dangerously of all, because it ties into those other three revolutions, as a sellout to foreign oppressors. A man who was selling his country to the outsiders. And in all four of these revolutions, the salient characteristic, ideologically speaking, besides political democracy, is nationalism. In Iran, China, Mexico, and Russia, a powerful form of nationalism emerges at the turn of the century. And in the El Hijo de la Huizote, we find these portrayals reaching mass consumption. Not to mention Frias and the other writers who with their dime store novels are reaching the literate public. Now, the turnaround intensified at the turn of the century because it was at that moment that the European economies uh, took a momentary tailspin. They went into crisis and there was a retrenchment of foreign investments. Uh, for example, the French, who dominated the Mexican textile industry, began to withdraw capital in absolute terms, not just slow down the rate of investment, which people needed as the young people who uh, enter the marketplace, they need jobs, they need new capital to be active there to provide employment opportunities. And the French were making absolute withdrawals in terms of the amount that they were in, uh, investing in Mexico's largest domestic industry, textiles. And the result was the great strike of 1898 because the French said, we not only are going to cut back on investments, we want to reduce your hours and your wages. 1898. And those withdrawals were also taking place in China, in Iran, in Russia, where new capital investments continued, but at a diminished scale. And so if you're going to create an intelligentsia within a dictatorial regime, such as the Mexican model was, you had better make sure the economy works. And if you're depending on a steady flow of foreign investments, best that the foreign investments continue, and continue at an increasing rate. Now, the Mexican economy had a running start. Back in the 1880s, there had been 50,000 workers put to, uh, to work on the railroad rights-of-way, constructing 14,000 miles of railroads. And that infusion of cash, the outlays for the machinery and the, uh, the labor, gave the Mexican economy the jump start it needed toward modernity. But by the 90s, that period of rapid building was over. And as a regularity set in, the new capital investments seemed to be going into timber and minerals. Now, suffice it to say that after the turn of the century, the Americans too, like the French, uh, began to have problems. In 1902, they had what we call the panic. And in 1907, another one in which some 80% of the banks in Texas closed. And that kind of contraction in financial activity had a profound impact in Mexico because foreign investors cut off their foreign commitments before they cut off their domestic ones. And so the large American investors in Mexico began to curtail uh, their commitments there. How important were they? U.S. capital enterprises controlled 70% of Mexico's incorporated entities, that is, business activities, were 70% American. The remaining 30%, two-thirds, were European. 
So we're looking at a country that had 10% domestic capital and 90% foreign capital utterly dependent on this umbilical cord of foreign capital flowing into their economy and suddenly that is cut off. And so the protests grew. Labor unrest intensified. Workers' uprisings occurred in 1906. And finally, in 1909-1910, an opposition presidential candidate emerged, Francisco Madero. Madero was really quite remarkable. He wrote a stunning book called The Presidential Succession, published at the time of his candidacy for the presidency of Mexico in 1910. In that book, he recommended a federal democratic republic with states having state rights and autonomous legislatures and governors elected by the people and a president with an autonomous Congress and universal male suffrage. This in a country that had a dictatorship. And remarkably, if you look at Madero's text closely alongside that of his contemporary Sun Yat-sen of China, you will find that Sun Yat-sen and Francisco Madero essentially wrote the same book with the same arguments, different words, but the same ideals, the same objectives prevailed in both revolutions. The Chinese Revolution of 1911, the Mexican Revolution of 1910. And from Madero's standpoint, being the son of Mexico's wealthiest industrial family, this was to be a democratic revolution, not a social confrontation between classes. This was to be something that would move Mexico toward modernity, but with serenity with peace and he attracted enormous crowds in fact in most of the cities the crowds numbered 10,000 and more and the police reacted accordingly they began to suppress the crowds and finally shortly before the election they placed candidate Madero under house arrest at President Diaz's orders the dictator placed him under house arrest And then the elections came, and guess who won? At the announcement of Diaz's electoral victory, Mexico City exploded in demonstrations. Marches on the National Palace protesting electoral fraud. The police were used, and Madero fled the country to San Antonio, Texas where he opted to challenge the electoral fraud militarily. And he issued a revolutionary proclamation from San Antonio, which he called the Plan of San Luis Potosí, the city from which he had fled uh, while he was under house arrest. He announced this He announced this rebellion on November 20th, 1910, a day that is now celebrated in Mexican history. He did a good job of politicking on the U.S. side of the board. He got Amer important American interests to support him so that the U.S. neutrality laws were uh, not enforced against him. But on the other hand, the fighting had to be done by the Mexicans themselves. This was not something in which the American government or American interests were really willing to take part in, uh, even though a lot of them were ready to see Diaz go because he was beginning to shift his interests toward other countries, favoring British petroleum interests over uh, American, over Standard Oil, and Doheny, the great American private operator in Mexico. So there are plenty of reasons why they no longer were so enamored with Diaz after 35 years in power, and they were willing to see him go. And so Madero did have the ability to operate from Texas, but he had to do it with Mexicans. And the Mexicans that he did it with uh, stand out forever in Mexican history. <laughs> 
uh, after he announced that plan, uh, two major factions emerged, one in the north and one in the south, willing to fight to overthrow the dictator. And the one in the south was led by Emiliano Zapata. And the one in the north, by Pascual Orozco and a lieutenant of his named Francisco Villa. Now the, the southerners had a really radical agrarian doctrine. They called for what they called the commune of the state of Morelos, where they were located, which uh, essentially argued that the land should belong to those who work it. And so this very radical program was enunciated by Zapata and the agrarians in the south uh, fought to create what they considered to be a form of agrarian justice. Uh, they called their plan the Plan de Ayala after the town where it was announced. It's a very, it's a very famous plan and ev eventually parts of its uh, agrarian doctrine were incorporated in the new Mexican constitution. But they're calling for agrarian social justice so that starving people uh, would have a way of supporting themselves as they had before all of this modernization began. That is to say, living in their village commons, uh, raising their corn, beans, and chiles, uh, and marketing the excess, the surpluses. In the north, the two leaders that emerged... Uh, the one in charge, Pascual Orozco, and his assistant, Francisco Villa, were both mule skinners. And by that, I do not mean that they went out and rode mules with whips and did all the heavy work. These people owned strings of mules. And they knew the mountains of the state of Chihuahua very well. They were entrepreneurs. Uh, Orozco owned about what I guess we'd call him a small trucking company owner today. He had about six strings of mules with mule skinners hauling supplies into the mountains to uh, take care of the mines and villages uh, up there. Uh, and with that provisioning trade, uh, Orozco did very well and he was quite rich. Uh, Villa was less wealthy, but he had more than one string of mules. He was running two or three. And they were very well known in the mountains by the miners and the lumberjacks and by the cowboys on the ranches of the countryside. Uh, Villa had a very colorful past. He'd also been a bandit. And he had adopted the name of a 19th century Chihuahua Robin Hood uh, named Francisco Villa. His real name was Doroteo Arango. But uh, Francisco Villa was a Robin Hood figure who in the 19th century was supposed to have robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. And so there's something there that we don't know about Villa. That is, why did he choose this name well before the revolution began? But the revolution was made to order for him. And these two men, to the surprise, I think, of everyone in concerned, including Madero, began to defeat the federal army in battle after battle. The critical fighting of the revolution in 1911 uh, took place in the state of Chihuahua. And it culminated in the spring of that year at the city of Ciudad Juarez across the river from El Paso when Villa and Orozco's men seized the city. Now at the moment they did that at Juarez, President Diaz in Mexico offered to negotiate his departure from office. We'll have an election. I'm going to leave. I have got a nice place in Paris, and I think maybe it's time for me to go there. Uh, and I'm going to leave, and we'll have a peaceful transition of office. Now, why would he do that with a defeat so far from home? This Juarez is almost 2,000 miles from Mexico City, with desert between the two. And the answer lies in the fact that throughout the country there were small uprisings in Veracruz, in Chiapas, in Campeche, 
in Michoacan, up and down both coastlines. Peasants were rising up, burning big houses, killing land owners, and Dios saw incipient chaos. And so as he fled the country, a reporter stopped him and said, what do you think about what Mr. Madero has done? And he said, Madero has unleashed a tiger. Let us see if he can ride it. But no one could, including Madero. Madero was a classic case of the revolutionary who underestimates uh, what he is doing. He looked for a modest political change, and like Gorbachev of the Soviet Union, failed to recognize the deep anguish of the people. He thought reforms would be enough. But once unleashed, this tiger would control Mexico for ten years. And so, with Madero coming to office, the revolutionaries celebrated. He occupied the presidency in the fall of 1911 with the full expectation uh, that Zapata would support him as had Villa and Orozco. They had accepted his electoral, his election and uh, gone back to life as normal. Orozco as the police chief of the state of Chihuahua and Villa in, quote, retirement. But Zapata said, I want to see your agrarian reform. Madero's agrarian reform consisted of taking government-owned lands and offering them to peasants and allowing litigation between villages that had lost their lands in the previous 35 years of the dictatorship to these privatizers that had taken the properties of the villages, letting them litigate in the courts, to which Zapata said, my God, the courts are the people that took it away from us. We can't do that. This means nothing to us. We want the land, and we want you to promise it to us now. And Madero would not do that. And so Zapata refused to lay down his arms. And unfortunately, while they were still talking, uh, the army turned on Zapata and tried to trap him and destroy his forces. And so a deep distrust developed between Madero and Zapata, and Zapata launched a civil war. And so while Madero was in office till February of 1913, a civil war with Zapata and the agrarians in southern Mexico plagued his regime and weakened it substantially. Now most of the country calmed down after Madero was elected. But while Zapata was fighting, the flare-ups began gradually once again. And by late 1912, the reports were pouring in from all the places that had been out of control in early 1911. Eighteen months later, the country was up in arms again. Now, during that time, Madero had tried to introduce some reforms. He had allowed unions to form in Mexico City by taking the police off of the, uh, wor the working class organizers. And so they were actually able to form unions, very radical unions. These unions are known as anarcho-syndicalists. And anarcho-syndicalists advocate workers' control of production. So they essentially wanted workers to control the factories, much the way the Zapatista peasants wanted peasants to control the land. So people with, associated with business and industry and the foreign interests, the Americans who, as you know, had 70% of the active capital in the country, were deeply concerned about what they considered to be Madero's weakness in dealing with dangerous elements in society. And so the American ambassador supported the overthrow of Madero in 1913 by a military dictator named Victoriano Huerta. Now, the problem here is that Huerta and the Americans, like Madero, were underestimating the fury, the built-up public fury here. A mere change in the presidency was not going to bring peace to Mexico. And if you let Madero go, he would lead another insurrection, 
against a much weaker Huerta regime than that which he had already toppled under Diaz. For whatever reasons, Francisco Madero and his vice president were assassinated while in jail and in the custody of General Huerta. And that night uh, led to the announcement of civil war. Far in the north, the governor of the state of Coahuila refused to accept Huerta's presidency and declared himself in revolution and said that he was going to uphold the constitution of the nation. And so he called his rebellion against Huerta the constitutionalist revolution. And he called upon the people to fight at his side. And in Sonora, the ultimate political winner of the revolution quickly rallied to Carranza's call. Alvaro Obregón, who was the mayor of a small town, but who was descended from the Sonoran oligarchy, a man of education, of high reputation, and tremendous ability. And so Obregón, operating out of Sonora, and Carranza, out of Coahuila, represented a powerful alliance. Sonora is that state immediately south of Arizona. Coahuila is immediately south of Eagle Pass, Texas, to give you a sense of geographic position. And in between those two states is the most powerful northern state of all, the state of Chihuahua. And there, Huerta's people were able to assassinate the leading Madaristas, the people that supported President Madero. And by eliminating those elite leaders in that state, they unwittingly turned the revolution far to the left. Because now in Chihuahua, instead of these great landowners such as Obregón and Sonora and Carranza, who were, Carranza is also a banker, a partner of the Frost Brothers in San Antonio, these are very well connected, responsible, conservative people who are fighting for democracy. But in Chihuahua, with the elimination of their cohort, the mantle of leadership fell to the working class, to Francisco Villa. And Villa immediately called himself a constitutionalist, a supporter of Carranza, and called on the people to rise with him. And so in February of 1913, from the date of Carranza's announcement, to the spring of 1913, the country kind of spun its wheels. Zapata was still fighting in the south, but he didn't have the military wherewithal to do much with Huerta. Obregón and Carranza didn't have a whole lot of military support. They were weak militarily relative to the federal army. But in the mountains of the Sierra Madre of Chihuahua, people calling themselves the Eastas began to register victory after victory coalescing control over areas in the mountains and then coming down into the valleys and taking the towns west of Chihuahua City at Cuauhtémoc and Casas Grandes. And finally, armies began to emerge from these coalescing forces calling themselves the Istas. Thousands at first and then tens of thousands. And they swept across the state and seized Juarez and Chihuahua and by late 1913, they were the dominant military force of the revolution. They began to, they, what they did, they confiscated massive cattle herds from the estates of the oligarchy, of the great landowners. And they would take the herds to El Paso and sell them for arms. And the great American arms companies gathered there, Remington, Colt, 
selling weapons to the Viistas. The Viistas confiscated the trains and began to use them to move their army. And they would move then across the state of Chihuahua toward the south, but maneuvering as well, both east and west, so that here's Ciudad Juarez, and they essentially, in terms of their basic movement during the course of 1913 and early 1914, they moved southward from Juarez to Chihuahua City, uh, to uh, Durango, to Zacatecas, and Torreon over here. And the great battles, the two largest battles, were fought here at Torreon and at Zacatecas. Now, there was a serious situation here behind the scenes. Many people calling themselves Zapatistas in the south and Viistas in the north were out of touch with their leaders. Some of them, like Yaqui Indians or Seltal Indians in Chiapas, the Yaqui Indians in Sonora, didn't even know they'd never had direct contact with Zapata or Villa. But they acted in their name. And they attacked the great estates, dividing them up. And some of the ones they attacked were American-owned. In fact, the Americans owned 130 million acres of Mexico's 485 million acre surface. Or about 27% of the nation was in the hands of large American landowners and settlers. There were about 45,000 American settlers. And so there was hell to pay for foreigners, Asians, Spaniards, and Americans, especially those three groups. The British and the Germans were not regarded with such hostility, or the French. And so the American uh, Navy hauled refugees away. They sailed both coasts, bringing refugees back to San Diego, California, Texas City, Texas, and New Orleans during the course of 1913 and 1914. Shiploads of them. And Villa began to march on Mexico City with a force that he now called the División del Norte. And the American government is pretty ambivalent about this guy. The División del Norte moved on trains along that central railroad line straight toward the heart of Mexico and General Huerta threw the bulk of his army against them to stop them. He ignored Zapata, Carranza, and Obregón. And at the great battles of Torreón and Zacatecas, the federal army was crushed by Villa's forces. And at that point, with victory looming imminent for these populist radicals who had, a, from the point of view of, of some elements in the American government, an irresponsible attitude toward private property, the Americans cut off his fuel supplies so the trains could not move. The coal was not forthcoming. They embargued the munitions on which his army depended from the American uh, arms manufacturers. And they also embargoed the south coast with the U.S. Navy to prevent Zapata from getting supplies. In the meantime, Obregón, moving southward along the Pacific coast, was able to cut south of Villa and into Mexico City as Huerta fled. And Huerta fled into exile in the middle of 1914. To ensure a safe outcome of the fighting, the U.S. administration of Woodrow Wilson uh, decided to intervene. And so in the midst of this effort to stop Villa and to create some kind of balance between Villa and Carranza and try to negotiate a satisfactory outcome from the standpoint of American interests, the U.S. invaded Veracruz on April 23, 1914. And what ensued is one of the sad chapters in U.S. history. Uh, in Pentagonese, 
uh, 200 and some people were killed. The chronista of the city of Veracruz estimates 10,000 civilians killed. The numbers clearly are too low and too high. Uh, I don't know the actual numbers, but it was a sorry episode uh, for the United States. These high-impact shells of recently retooled heavy uh, cruisers and battle wagons literally leveled the city, devastating the populace. And then the Americans began a six-month occupation ending on November 23, 1914. Now, during that time, the two contending arrays of forces had defined themselves pretty clearly. And one side, supporting Carranza and Obregón, uh, had been forced to evacuate central Mexico. The other side, combi uh, combining Villa and Zapata, had seized Mexico City and set up a government there. They called themselves the Conventionalists, after a convention they held. And so they're fighting the Constitutionalists. But the Constitutionalists, believe it or not, had the better long-term prospects. While Villa could smuggle weapons across the border, it was the Constitutionalists who would have access to manpower and arms on a scale sufficient to defeat the Conventionalists of Villa and Zapata. And I want to very briefly tell you how that happened in a period that we might call um, class conflict and civil war. The regional elite people, and by the way, if you noticed, Obregón, from the Sonoran oligarchy, a mayor, a landowner, Carranza, a landowner, and a banker, these are people of the regions, of the provinces, and they're elites, and they lead their movement, and they seek like-minded, like same social type people uh, to lead their military formations. While on the other side, you have rural working class formations led by Villa and Zapata and cowboys and timbermen and farmers. In those few weeks before Villa's people were finally able to move forward into Mexico City because of their shortages of fuel, Obregón was there and he did some critical work. He went to the industrial workers, those unions that were forming in Mexico City, those anarcho-syndicalists, and he said, our revolution will be the worldwide, the beginning of the worldwide proletarian revolution. It will start right here in Mexico with you. And wherever our armies go, you will organize the workers of these cities, and the red flag will fly over them. And these workers, by the way, had a red and black flag that they called the Roji Negra. And so they made a deal in which the workers would join the Constitutionalist Revolution and offer their manpower to it. And some five to 6,000 of them left Mexico City. There were already miners, militias, and other workers groups from Coahuila and Sonora and other places that were part of the Constitutionalist Revolution. But now five to 6,000 of them joined the Constitutionalists and they moved to Veracruz where the Americans are. And they formed what they called the Red Battalions for the, uh, with these workers. Now, the workers belonged to an organization that they have called the House of the World Worker, the Casa del Obrero Mundial. And here they are in, Mex in Veracruz now with the constitutionalists who have fled, uh, fled central Mexico. And here are the Americans. And at this point, the U.S. Uh, introduces a program that they used first at Bluefields, Nicaragua in 1909. And they would use at Murmansk and Vladivostok in 1919 against the Soviet revolutionaries. And most recently, they used uh, in Bosnia. It's called, the Pentagon calls it uh, EAT, EAT, Equip and Train. 
And so what they did in Veracruz was turn the place into a kind of Da Nang Vietnam type arsenal, a vast sea of arms with millions of rounds of ammunition, tens of thousands of rifles, uh, dumb dumb bullets, poison gas, barbed wire, Mercedes Benz trucks, uh, almost anything you can imagine was there to equip and create a new army under the command of General Obregón. And that army then came out with industrial workers comprising the core units and marched toward the oil fields to the north where the American oil companies and the British had hit major gushers. Mexico was at that time the second leading oil producer in the world. So there's a lot at stake here. And the Vistas are marching on these oil fields from central Mexico and the constitutionalists with their newly armed army rush north to meet them at a place called El Ebano. And in January of 1915, the two forces came into contact at El Ebano. They clashed there with dramatic results. An American eyewitness, because this place was owned by Standard Oil, El Ebano was. And he said, geez, you know, the the Eastas began showing up several days before the battle. These ragtag guys with half-starved horses, and some of them were barefoot, and their guns and their ammunition mismatched and they had brass cannons from the Civil War. You know, just really kind of like wretched characters. And they stole my food, they ate my cattle, and what have you, and then they marched on down the road. Some of the officers stayed for a day or so until the battle began. He said, then you could hear the roar of the artillery in the distance. And he knew that those were not Vista guns because they didn't have those kinds of guns. And then the Vistas began streaming back by the house there at L.A. Beno, the rancho, wounded, broken, and their carts hauling their equipment as best they could. And then there was a half day of silence, and then the marching of feet, as men in brand new uniforms marching in order with Mercedes-Benz trucks and field radios arrived at the Constitutionalist Army with its modern armor. And that, in a very succinct unbiased report by an eyewitness tells you what happened to the Viistas. They are overwhelmed by modern technology and arms. Equip and train. The Red Battalions had fought and defeated the peasants, thinking that they were going to bring about this new workers' order. But to their surprise, with Villa defeated in central Mexico and retreating to the north to conduct a guerrilla war, and with Zapata retreating back into the mountains of the south, Carranza, who is the head of the revolution, and now calling himself the first chief and soon president of Mexico, Carranza ordered the Red Battalions immediately disbanded. And so they came back to Mexico City and they began making all kinds of demands about labor and working conditions and the end of script monies. They wanted to be paid in real cash. And uh, no one would do this. They had two general strikes in 1916 over this. And the second strike was broken by the army, by Carranza's army, and the strike leaders arrested. And when the strike leaders appealed to Obregón, who had been the fellow who said, we're going to create the proletarian world revolution here in Mexico, when they appealed to him, he said, I think you should disband. And so they did. On the pain of more severe penalties if they didn't. Now that wouldn't be the end of organized labor. There would be a very radical uh, labor movement for the next 25 years. But it was now under control. And the peasants were beaten. And so as the Constitutionalist Army spread out across the country pursuing the Viistas and pursuing the Zapatistas, uh, they held a convention. It met in late 1916, and, and in February of 1917, it promulgated its conclusions. It called for the nationalization of all strategic properties, which included, I might add, the bulk of the foreknown properties held by the Americans. 
Article 27 of that Constitution called for the restoration of all the lands to the people that had been taken on illegally and under special procedures all people could apply for land and would their right as Mexicans to have land would be recognized. So the Zapatistas got a lot of what they wanted right there. The big difference between what the Zapatistas wanted and what the new government was willing to give them was control. Control, power. We will give you the land, yes. But you will not get your municipio libres to be actually autonomous villages. Rather, the federal government will decide what land and how much. So Zapata's idea of a nation built on small, independent municipalities self-governing the way Indian America was is being defeated by a centrist model governed from Mexico City with some very zealous radical people making sure that agrarian justice was dealt out and if you look at the composition as I have of that agrarian commission that ran the agrarian program in Mexico for the next half century boy they are really after it they're really trying to do the job but they have a different set of priorities they want to do agrarian justice for the people whereas the Zapatistas wanted agrarian justice by the people there's a slight and a very important difference now the labor movement also was given tremendous concessions by the revolutionaries that came under article 123 and article 123 uh, provided for labor rights for all Mexican workers adjudicating working hours, wages, uh, right to strike, arbitration, uh, gender and child labor provisions, protecting uh, female workers from heavy onerous uh, tasks during pregnancy, all this sort of thing. A really remarkable document, far ahead of its time, 20 years before the Wagner Act in the United States, which essentially gave the U.S. workers the same rights. So all this was written down. And by 1920, uh, Carranza, as president of Mexico, had begun to act in very tentative ways uh, only in one area, and that was vis-a-vis -vis the foreigners. He was nationalizing properties, but he was not doing anything on behalf of agrarians and workers. And so there was tremendous popular pressure to get rid of him, especially when he decided to use a junior lieutenant as a means of keeping power in the presidency. That is, he'd have his lieutenant made president and then he would rule from behind the scenes. At least that's what his opponents felt that he was going to do. And so in 1920 they rose up around General Obregón and threw him out of office and he was assassinated trying to get away. He had the sense to take the treasury with him, maybe that's why he was assassinated. And so President Obregón seized power in 1920 as a as a general they set up an interim president and then he ran for election and was overwhelmingly elected there's no question that he was a popular choice and it was the last violent transition that is to say in 1920 Mexico underwent its last violent political change and thereafter it would have a remarkably stable political system initiated by the revolutionary elites that emerged from this struggle between Carranza, Obregón, Zapata, and Villa. And then began what I think is the most remarkable era uh, in Latin American history. The revolutionary program of 1920-1940. Sometimes associated with President Lázaro Cárdenas who ruled from 1934 to 1940. But it actually began with President Obregón in 1920. I know I gave you his name before, but it never hurts to get it again. So here's Obregón in 1920. And he began 
to go back and look at these large land grants that had been given to foreign interests during the Dios period between 1876 and 1910. And this new constitution said, hey, you know, anything that establishes monopolies is counterproductive and therefore illegal. A monopoly stifles trade and the rights of people to realize themselves. It's written in the Constitution. And so the constitutional writers and their wisdom said, we give the president the power to nullify said monopolies. And Obregón began to nullify on a colossal scale. And he nullified the ownership of gigantic tracts of land on both coasts and both frontiers of Mexico that were owned by Americans. The T.O. Riverside Ranch, a million four hundred thousand acres, over there just opposite Big Bend around Ojinaja up toward El Paso, extending deep into the state of Chihuahua. It had been developed by the Swift Packing House. They owned it to the Morris family, their heirs. They had dug deep water wells, all drilled them all over the, the estate, and they had hundreds of thousands of cattle out there at one time. Or tens of thousands, anyway. A lot of cattle. And the Vistas had driven away the cattle, and now the president said, hey, this is a monopoly. Nobody else can do business here because you occupy everything. And so they seized over a million acres of it, only leaving 200,000 acres. And then the Swiss had the temerity to complain about that. And so by the end of the 1930s, uh, uh, they had taken those 200,000. Uh, over in the state of Tamaulipas, along the Gulf Coast, you know, the state's name is not so important, there was a hacienda called the San Jose, a million two hundred and fifty thousand acres, beautiful place, with the Boquillas River running through the middle of it. Two ranges of mountains, one on either side, both encompassed by the hacienda, but this beautiful fertile valley. And the local tax assessors and local authorities had a way of getting at that property. First, the president nullified half of it because it was too close to the coast and it constituted a monopoly. But then the, uh, the authorities came in and they said, we only want 60,000 acres of it for the use of Mexicans. And they took the 60,000 acres on both sides of the river, leaving the American owners high and dry. And at that point, the American owners said, well, geez, can't pay taxes on something like that. There's nothing to be done with the land. And as soon as they stopped paying taxes, the Mexican sheriff foreclosed for tax arrears, and the San Jose de las Rusias became Mexican again. This went on all over the country. Uh, the great Palomas Hacienda, Two point five million acres, the largest hacienda in Mexico, extended from Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, all the way over to Arizona. That you know, you know the map there. You know how New Mexico, about half of New Mexico, extends westerly from from El Paso, Las Cruces, to the Arizona line. If you were to go to the Mexican side of that, uh, you're looking at two point five million acres of land owned by Edwin Marshall, the former secretary of the Texas Oil Company founding secretary, board of directors, one of the richest men in the United States. Uh, he had given uh, the U.S. government the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, he gave them Vandenberg Air Force Base and the Golita Oil Reserve that's used by the U.S. Navy today. This was a very powerful individual. Well, President Obregón said, hey, this is a monopoly. Mexicans cannot do business here uh, with one person and a foreigner at that owning all this land. And he nullified the grants because Diaz, Diaz's action was unconstitutional. When Diaz had said, you can have this land, he was creating a monopoly, and therefore the president could nullify it. And they did. So the Mexican Revolutionary Program directly challenged the U.S., and I think is probably the highest manifestation of nationalism that the Western Hemisphere has ever seen. Just can you imagine if Fidel Castro had tried anything even approaching this? I mean, Fidel Castro's uh, nationalizations are penny ante alongside what they did. He also, if you're not convinced yet, nationalized the oil companies. In 1938, he nationalized the American oil companies. Let's see Fidel try that one. And he nationalized 
the remaining 50% of the Mexican railroad system and the control, which resided with some banks. Let's see, what were their names? Uh, Citibank, Morgan Bank, Chase. Oh, well, he's not taking on anybody very strong there. So here's the Mexican president, Cardenas, seizing the oil companies and the railroads and giving out 44 million acres of land in agrarian reform between 1930 and 1940. And President Obregón using the nullification power to seize literally tens of millions of acres and restoring them to Mexican national control from which they could do all kinds of things. Here you are, you're a state building elite, you're trying to consolidate your regime and you say, well, uh, Governor Kellogg uh, you know, her, her loyalty is kind of iffy here. Let's give her one of those ranchos up there on the T.O. Riverside. And let's give uh, uh, Mayor O'Brien uh, that other rancho on the other side of the uh, Palomas Hacienda. So you could reward and you could bring back local and provincial elites who maybe supported Villa or maybe were just a little bit questionable as to where they might be leaning in the political uh, scene. And marry them to the regime. And at the same time, you could dispense agrarian justice by giving the land to the agrarians. And so what you end up with is peasant land dispersals, local elite and regional elite, and national control over the land. Mexicans replacing foreigners in ownership. Now in Quintana Roo, Yucatan, Chiapas, there were two major entities. One was owned by a fellow, the heirs of the Skiddy Company of uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and by the Mengel Company of, uh, of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, the Mengel operation was 800,000 acres uh, around inland from Chetumal there, if you ever go down to look at the Mayan ruins down that way. This was all American-owned, and it was taken back. And then the great comeuppance or I should say conclusion, if you will, of the nationalization program occurred on January 2nd, 1940, in which President Cardenas, after 20 more, more than 20 years of bickering between Mexican presidents, starting with President Carranza, and then Obregón, and finally ending with Cardenas, ended 20 years of bickering with a group of oil men and bankers in New York who owned what they called the Laguna Corporation. The Laguna Corporation controlled uh, two and a half million acres directly, and with its affiliated and a allied companies, about six million acres of potential oil lands on the shores of Campeche, the great Campeche oil lake, as we now know it as the second largest oil uh, source in the world, com comparable to the Caspian Sea. That struggle went on for over 20 years, and Cardenas ended it with a flourish on January 2nd, 1940. Uh, and they did it without the Americans acting with such anger as they would to Castro, who used very, very bad timing at the end of the 50s. And the reason was that at the same time the Mexicans were recapturing their na what they considered to be their national patrimony, they were working carefully with the Americans as allies providing labor, natural resources, and all kinds of cooperative exchanges during the onset and process of World War II. And so President Roosevelt was willing to do this, was willing to see these great American interests literally confiscated by the Mexicans in an unprecedented and unparalleled manner because it meant having a solid ally that would provide manpower for agriculture and hydroelectric power and natural resources, rubber. My God, they produced rubber on just by the hundreds, by the thousands of tons uh, in northern Mexico during that time and transmitted it uh, to the U.S. war machine. The uh, rubber came in the form of a uh, wayule. And it was produced by a company called the Intercontinental 
uh, rubber company of Mexico, which was tied to U.S. rubber. It's a great big conglomerate of interest. And Intercontinental had uh, rubber lands in the Congo and in Sumatra and in Mexico. It was run by Bernard Baruch and William Rockefeller and others. And it was a really powerful combine. And so they were happy to keep their lands a bit longer because the Mexicans had threatened to take those properties uh, during the course of the 30s. Uh, and when the war was over and that kind of rubber production was being replaced by synthetics because Waiule was a low-grade rubber used for industrial um, processes and that sort of thing but not for high-grade high cosmetic type finishes. And at that point, the Mexicans gradually absorbed those properties until they were all Mexican-owned during the course of the 40s. But that was very low-key and it was penny-ante compared to what went on before. Uh, other companies in Mexico that were that had their uh, properties nationalized include Cargill Lumber, the John Deere Company, International Harvester, Chase Manhattan Bank, which had properties in Sonora. Uh, it's a who's who of the American power elite. And so the nationalism that manifested itself in the 1890s with such drama, with such a concern on the part of social protesters that, that felt that Mexico was losing its soul and literally its material independence as foreigners bought up its industrial machine, bought up its natural resources and its real estate. By 1940, the country had really taken back virtually all of that. In addition to that, the Mexican Revolution during the 20s and 30s uh, move toward what I think we would have to call an ultimately failed effort to create social democracy in a broader, based, a broader base of political participation. They organized a massive peasants organization known as the National Confederation of Campesinos In 1940, there were 20 million Mexicans. 20 million Mexicans, uh, by the way, if you notice, that's only a 5 million increase since 1910. So the turmoil had caused a lot of people to migrate. There had been a great deal of unrest and a lot of killing. Some of the estimates of death during the period of 10 years of fighting has uh, reached as much as a million. I think those are exaggerations, but a lot of people fled. So in 1940, there were 20 million people, and if you assume of those 20 million, about 75 to 80 percent were still rural, we're looking at 14 million. About 2 million of them were organized in the National Confederation of Campesinos. So that's a good percentage of the people. And another million and a half in urban labor syndicates, unions, that were tied to the government by President Cardenas in his effort to create this participatory political system. The unions will have their conglomerate. The peasants, instead of being all these disparate 10,000 little pueblos, and that's literally how many there were, 10,000 little pueblos scattered across the Mexican countryside, now they'll have one great bargaining unit. And then he organized the big capitalists and the little capitalists and the petty capitalists and what have you into all sorts of special interest groups and they too would have organized representation. So the idea was that this would create a kind of a, of a, a moderating role for the central government. Well, unfortunately, we know that extreme differences of education and wealth and power in a society will lead to control by those elements, those elites, uh, that have the most of that education, wealth, and power. And so it wouldn't surprise you, I suppose, to find that a half century after President Cardenas introduced that model for a democratic equilibrium, that we end up with functionaries controlling these organizations, these mass organizations, on behalf of political elites closely tied to the financial elites. 
And so Mexico ends up with one of the two or three most skewed patterns of wealth and power in the industrialized world. A country in which as many as 50% are considered to be in extreme poverty as opposed to poverty. And when the Mexican government alludes to extreme poverty, they mean extreme. We're not talking about safety nets here, uh, you know, with food stamps and this sort of thing. And a society in which about 20% of the people would be categorized today as middle class, with perhaps 80% of the wealth controlled by 2% of the wealth holders. This is a very skewed economic balance, and it's reflected in the polity of the nation. Now, remarkably, there are other forces at work. And if you look at the modern Mexican political scene, you'll see the direct ties to the revolution, the idealism of Zapata and Villa, the idealism of Obregón and Carranza, of Cardenas, is still there. And today we have an emergent political structure in which three parties are arguing the same arguments that we saw in 1910. The PAN, the Party of National Action, representing very powerful private interests, supports private enterprise and privatization of land, as does the leadership of the party that inherited the mantle of power from the revolutionary elites, known as the party of revolutionary institutions, or the PRI. It too supports privatization. It's been selling, it's still in power, it still controls the presidency and the Congress, and they've been selling railroads and all that back to foreign interests. In fact, it's rather interesting, the foreign interests buying these are the same ones that own them uh, back in the 30s. So there's a tremendous staying power on the part of the Americans that I'm beginning to appreciate as I watch my newspapers. And then the other party, representing the idealism of President Cardenas, the PRD, uh, stands for protecting Mexican, uh, the Mexican position, to Mexico's ownership of the means of production, Mexican control, taxing income, uh, redistributing wealth defending the rural cooperatives of the peasants. And so we have here a, a full circle in which today in the late 90s we find the Mexican political system once again in crisis with the same level of nationalistic concern, concern about foreign power, and yet a recognition by all parties concerned, as we had at the turn of the century a hundred years ago, that the foreigners are essential to national development, to new technology, to new jobs. Any comments or questions? Yes. I'll pose a question. Um, You've given us a very clear outline of the events and the processes that took place. I wonder if you could comment briefly on how it is or why it is that your interpretation of the revolution might differ from interpretations of other historians. I think the biggest uh, difference would be uh, there's a revisionist group today that challenges the issue of nationalism. And so over the last uh, 10 years I've been researching the archives uh, and came up with the, some of the information I've shared with you today about Obregón's nationalizations and the seizure of these enormous American properties because largely I think the profession has not known about the, this, the extent of foreign control that existed. And for example, the Constitution in 1917, the writers called for a prohibition of foreign ownership along the coasts and frontiers and as I began to map out these properties, I realized that the coast and frontiers were owned by Americans. So at least people knew that. And so they're moving against Americans. And then when you turn to the agrarian reform uh, archives of the Mexican government, it'll say property such and such, American, and they have a red pencil under it. 
uh, they're moving to seize control of their national assets. And I think that's probably uh, one argument that I will win. And I think uh, when they see the data, they'll just simply shrug their shoulders and say, oh, well, okay, and then they'll whatever. I can't anticipate what the objections will be. I'm sure there will be some. But I think there will be a general agreement that, uh, indeed, the nationalism that was originally identified by historians in the 30s was essentially correct, that that original interpretation was closer to the truth than the revisionists. Yeah. Do you think American companies are rushing to invest in Mexico or perhaps in Mexico as a nationalistic tradition? Yes, I think the important difference would be that they not buy land. I think as long as they're investing money and bettering things, that the Mexicans will receive them in a cooperative, fraternal way. But if they try to buy assets and take over things at the ground level, they will not be well received. 